Get on the drums. <sighs> Bam. Good uh, good African drum. Yeah, you're channeling that African energy. <laughs> to get things in. I okay, so today, uh, dude, like, it was probably a ye- not even a year ago that I listened to you on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's Is It Invest Like the Rest? Uh, invest Like the Best. Invest Like the Best uh, podcast. A friend of mine, Jonathan Novi had seen me actually earlier in the year at a wedding. And he said, kind of gauge where I was. He said, listen, you should listen to this podcast. Um, It's a financial podcast, but I think you'll really like this guy, Boyd Vardy. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I kind of downloaded it. And this was in like September. I didn't listen to it. I think it was just the the financial thing. And I was like so deep into these other ideas, whether, you know, plant medicine, spirituality, and so I, I couldn't be thrown off of that. He happened to come back into town in like April and we had breakfast and he's like, hey, did you ever listen to that podcast? I was like, no, he goes, you really should listen to it. It's like, okay. Like he said this to me twice. There's something in this podcast. And so I listened to it and it was amazing. And he, he was, he understood where I was at and, um, you know, I don't think I had finished the podcast and I was online looking to see if there were any retreats that were still open um, for enrollment. And it just so happened that there was one person on the retreat that I ended up coming on that was like on the wait list that they weren't sure that they were coming. And then I forget who it was said, okay, the spot's open. Boom. I booked it. And, And it's very much my nature. We were talking about this before that when I experience someone's wisdom, their learning, their wisdom, uh, their their medicine, I need more than just to listen to them on a podcast or read the book. Like I need to be in the experience. That's why I've gone to a couple of silent retreats with Ajishante. Um, you're you were no different, and so was excited to go. It was, as as we've talked about, and I think people on this podcast already know, it was a transformational experience for me to be in South Africa, to be with other men, to be with you and your sister, Braun, and the teachings um, that were able to come through you and then through each of us, which I think is important for people to understand. It's not, you're not giving people advice. You're allowing their own medicine to present in front of them. And I think that's such an important part of how we learn. And I used to be the guy to give advice. And uh, I had, I was well-intentioned just like a lot of people are, but I've realized that that's not the way to really help people create change. So anyway, without further ado, <laughs> uh, and again, thanks to Jonathan Novi for, for this intro, because uh, this wouldn't have happened without him. But uh, Boyd Vardy, uh, welcome to The Great Unlearn. Ah, thanks. I mean, so much for having me, Adam. As you're talking to me, the, one of the things that's coming to mind is, you know, to reach a place in your journey where you are so willing uh, to go for the things that start to hit something inside of you. Because it's, it's absolutely no sh- small feat to go online, book a retreat that is probably on the more expensive side. So there's like this financial, you know, am I going to do this? Get a plane, fly to South Africa, which freaking miles away. Mm. Um, and there's, when Bronner and I first started running retreats out there, we were, we thought like, geez, who's going to come to South Africa uh, to do this? And but what we found is that people who did come, they were in, they were committed. They wanted uh, they were showing up because of the challenge of actually getting there. They were hungry for transformation. And it's amazing. It's amazing sort of barrier to entry. But what it means is you get people who really are in. They, they're in for the experience. So that's, you know, 
amazing to you to like be willing to follow that track so with so much uh intention um and then i mean in the way i guess we'll get into all other parts <laughs> we'll the retreat, but like, it, but sure, last night last night one image that did come to me just as i was drifting off to bed was you know there's like this amazing thing of like we meet you know we meet and we get to know each other and then like flash forward three days and we crouch behind a termite mound and this huge elephant bull mm -hmm. is walking towards us and we're working out with which way the wind is blowing we're working out if we if we've got enough cover um we see that he wants to come back to the tree on the mound that we are crouching behind <laughs> to get to the roots and he turns and he starts to lope towards us and renius is like we need to move we need to get out of here and as i was falling asleep i was just having all of those imagery and I think to to your other point is like you can talk about that, but having been in that experience together, like having been in a shared encounter like that, it just changes everything. And and it's about how we handle it together. It's about how we are with each other in that encounter. And it's the fact that whatever happens, we've been in that together. We've been in that moment together with a six ton elephant bull loping towards us and us working out our extraction. And to me, inside of the masculine. It's like shared endeavor, mm. doing together has been one of the things that we've lost, you know, like ways of being together that are cohesive, that are, there's, there's an intention to it. We're tracking together. We're operating together out there in the bush. Um, you know, you don't have to try and do icebreakers and get the group to come together because it happens. It's like, it's instinctual inside of us. We're like, we're out here. We have to operate together. We have to, it just starts to happen. And that's really what I love about using wilderness as an environment for masculine retreat, you know? Yeah, and I love the, well, and I love the example uh, of when we were all together in that experience because in, in, in that moment, um, and I think you referred to, to him as Big Tusker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I went into the, to the gift shop and I bought like a little wooden uh, elephant with the big tusks and everything, because it, it was the first time in my life that I had felt the presence of another so viscerally that it was both terrifying on some level, because I understood that if we aren't in this together and we're not doing this properly, that there could be some dire consequences. But as terrifying as it was, it was exhilarating to actually feel, to feel and I think that's what we have lost. We've lost the ability to feel what feeling is because we're distracted with many things and we're all trying to do the best we can. But the beauty of, you know, you call it the Londolozzi uh, time warp and it's getting set in that location. You can't help but be present. And I think that um, that was one of the greatest gifts I mean, I'll never forget that for a number of reasons, but just, it was like, just feeling alive and feel like, like feeling the feelings. That, uh, you know, people are not looking for the meaning of life. They're looking for the feeling of being alive. And to me in that moment, when that bull turns and what is he, 40 yards away from us and he starts to move towards us. One of the amazing things is Renius, who's obviously one of the best trackers in the world, his reaction, there's no bravado in it. Um, he immediately starts to work out how to extract us well, using cover, staying downwind. And, and what I get out of it is relationally in that moment to that elephant, like I'm also being given a kind of humility. Like we're experiencing ourselves not as like, we're here, but we're here, you're here. And now in relation to each other, this feeling comes alive inside of me. I feel this biology turn on like, whoa, that's a six ton, you know, 35 year old elephant bull. Um, and as I feel myself as a part of that ecosystem, I, it's humbling. And, you know, it's, I don't have to work on being humble in that moment. I just am. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is how in the natural world, it's, it's a relational environment. Um, as opposed to a comparative environment. And inside of that relationalness, feeling is the language all the time. Like I, you create a feeling in me, I create a feeling in you, and we know ourselves better inside of those feelings being conjured between us. Mm -hmm. um, so 
to me, the African environment, the wilderness is, is a place where we discover deeper parts of ourselves in connection all the time. And to feel yourself as a part of that natural environment without trying, as you feel yourself humbled by that elephant, as you feel that power, as you feel that beauty, uh, and then you feel yourself there. I belong there too. This incredible feeling of belonging just starts to take root. You just know like, you're here, I'm here, we're all here, and we belong here together. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in a comparative society, the search for meaning gets reduced to how am I doing in comparison to you? And so, and that is, that's extremely isolating because in order to know how I'm doing, I have to gauge myself against you, not in relation to you. And so that's why, I mean, I just feel like I, I would never think of myself as, I, I feel like what I am trying to do is create experiences that just put people into the natural world. And then it just happens, you know, it just starts to, to flow through. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's your humility coming out because I think that does, that container sets it up for that, for that learning. But you and Bron and obviously Alex and Rainius facilitate that so that it can really come out. It's not just, I mean, sure, anybody going on the reserve can feel a different experience than what they would feel here. But I think with that in mind, um, yeah, I'll just speak from my own experience that you oh, guys were you. amazing. Uh, and, and it's interesting because you bring up the comparison idea. I mean, that was like kind of one of the central tenets of this podcast and just how I lived for so long in this this comparison paradigm. And I and I love to use the the Teddy Roosevelt quote that, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And I had always thought um, that it's more about connecting to yourself, which I think it is, but in connecting to yourself, then it becomes a relational thing with others and in, in versus comparison. So that's, I appreciate that kind of insight as well. Yeah, it's cool. You know, I mean, you pick that card, you pull that card out of the deck, which includes the term Ubuntu. Yeah. And so just a little backstory here. Yesterday, uh, Boyd was on his way here and I had woke up in the morning. This was actually two Somewhat unrelated, but as we know, everything's related. Uh, I just decided, you know, tomorrow, you know, this morning, I'm going to pull a card from this Earth Warriors Oracle deck. And I pulled a card and it happens to be on the front cover of the book. So it's like the kind of seminal card in the book. And it says, Kayini, can, can, Kanini, how do you pronounce Kanini. it? Kanini. Yes, it's, it's Australian. And so as I was reading it, Boyd, go ahead. So Kanyini is the Australian term for a term that is uh, that is well known amongst people in South Africa too, which is the term Ubuntu, which means that I am because of you, or said another way, people are not people without other people. And the mm -hmm. idea in a more collective consciousness, which is what you get in Africa, if you go into the villages in Africa, uh, you find a much more collective mindset. It's what I think of as a we mindset rather than an I mindset. It's about being empath empathetically connected all the time. And if someone is suffering, then everyone in the village is suffering. You know, there's this, and if someone is joyful, then everyone in the village is joyful because it's not I, it's we together. Um, and I've always, the root of the word Ubuntu, uh, it, Ubuntu, it means it almost translates directly out of Zulu as the peoples, like, like oneness in amongst the people. And I've always been in, trying to extend it to uh, to say that it is not only through other people that we experience the deepest parts of ourselves, but it is through, you know, all life. Mm -hmm. In relation to all life, we start to discover ourselves. And so it's just kind of cool that you pulled that and and the sort of the remedy to that comparative uh, comparative nature is is something much more connected. And it's a lost art form. One of the things that I've been struck by and that we've been talking about is one of the challenges that I find traveling around is that people have forgotten how to go under pretense. You know, someone was telling me about these, they go out to dinners in New York and the dinner is, is just endlessly catching up. Oh, where have you been? I did this. I did this. Oh, we've been doing this. We've been doing, and everyone talks about what they've been doing and kind of catches each other up on what they've been doing. And no one actually talks about how, where they're at, how they are. It's just like mm. you get together and you tell everyone what you've been doing and then you all disperse. And I think it's an art form to try and learn to go under more social pretense and actually start to work out how to connect again more deeply. 
the last art form. I love that. Well, so let's let's give the listeners uh, something to work with here because I think you bring up a great point, and that is so common. I think, um, fortunately, where where I'm at today, and I think where you're at, our dinner conversations aren't about what we've been doing. It's about really unpacking like where we're at and where we want to go. But like, what are, what are some ways that you would uh, introduce a conversation like for people out there who you know, you're going out to your typical dinner with three other couples? Like, how do you get into, go from the catalog of what's been going on to the present moment? How would you start to unpack that? Yeah, it's a great question. One of the things is actually to, to work out in advance some of what you really want to know, you know? Um, and just to take it a little bit deeper. So the difference between, um, you know, hey, how, how are you? What's you know, and or the difference between that and something like, um, what is what's really calling you right now? What do you what are you feeling really called to right now? Um, and then just to see how that starts to to shape things. Just going a little deeper, or sitting in it, or being actually you being willing to share what's actually been going on with you from a deeper place, and being by being willing to go there, you know, like last night I said to you, one of, one of my challenges at the moment and one of my points of interest is what do I really want? You know, there's, there's a whole lot of things that I could do. There's some great incoming that might look like this is what success is, but what do I really want? Um, and that immediately took us into another place. What, what do I really want? What do you really want? What are we actually looking for? And the conversation went from there. Um, so I think just being willing to sort of go there a little bit. Yeah, and I think uh, just to expand a little bit about last night's conversation, you talked about really as you've stepped into this space, a flood of opportunities coming your way. Yeah. And this this really, this Western idea of success is, well, I say yes to all of this because if I do, then I, as you said, I scale. Yes. And that's unfortunately is kind of deeply ingrained in us. You have the, the sense in the awareness to know, okay, that is one way that I'm feeling, but that doesn't necessarily feel good for me to say yes to all these opportunities because at the end of the day, they're not all what I want. Yeah, and there's also like, there's a sense of scarcity in it. Like if I don't say yes to all of this now, it's going to go away. You know, that's so there's like this little scarcity thing running underneath it. Oh, yeah. Then there's like the unforeseen consequences. So, you know, <laughs> like say yes to all the speaking opportunities and live your life on a plane, mm -hmm. you know? And there's, so there's a balance to it. Like, yes, I want to spread the message. No, I don't want to live on a plane all the time. Um, and then trying to work out, well, okay, well, what do I want? Well, I, I'd want time to write, you know? I, I'd never want to be pulled away too much from tracking. Tracking is my art form. And if I said yes to all the incoming, I'm not going to get any time to track. I'm not going to get any time to write. I'm not going to get any time to track. Um, so then as those start to emerge, there starts to be like, okay, so those things are critically important. Um, I love to run groups and I particularly love to run groups in nature. Okay, so then that has to be prioritized. Um, and so, yes, we could go and run, you know, management offsites all over the country, but that's going to take me away from the things that I actually want. But I would be super successful if I went, you know, Fuck, throw, yeah. you know yeah. be like, boys <laughs> everywhere, facilitating everything. Yeah. You know? And so it's just, and I feel a part of myself going like, yeah, here we go, you know? And there's the money piece and there's the, um, and then this, this other side of me is like, just being inside the design mindset. You know, let me do enough of that, but let me make sure that I don't, that, that the idea of success pulls me away from what actual success would be, which would be, solitude, time tracking, time to write, connection with people who, who are close to me. Yeah. And I, I heard an analogy not too long ago of, of you have this uh, container and those things you just pointed out, those four or five things are the big rocks. And so if you want to do those big rocks, you have to put those in first. Yeah. 
And then you throw all the other stuff in because those are that's like the sand. That's the stuff that's important. You you know you need that for whatever the reasons are. And then that just fills in all the cracks. But if you go in with the sand first, you're not going to fit all the rocks. Totally. And as you're talking, what I'm thinking for me is to put the things that put me into presence in first, you know, as opposed to to put me to put in the things that would put me into major financial success first. You know, and it's just like a different, it's a different mindset. And I'm not naive about it. Like, yeah, there's some great work out there that I would like to do. Um, and I feel grateful to have that kind of incoming, but I just, I'm, I'm aware of wanting to balance it and not just saying, okay, here it comes. Let's go. Let's just go towards where there seems to be a big flow of income. Yeah. And, and we were talking about this last night and, and for, for all of you that are maybe just getting your, your feet wet with some spirituality and maybe you're trying to figure out what Buddhism is, Buddhism deals a lot in paradoxes. And so what they would say is, yeah, you don't, and, and you know this, we talked about this, you don't need to just do the tracking or do this other thing. You can do both. And just being in the right relationship with those things and how they work together. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's the key, um, just to be mindful enough to say, okay, great. Here's some of this, here's some of that. And now how do we put it together in a way that actually feels balanced and supportive and um, allows me to stay connected to the right things? Mm. Yeah. So, and I also, <laughs> one thing that came up for you that it gave me a little zinger was scarcity. And, and before we got on, we were talking about my experience recently with scarcity where I, you know, it's happened as I've been, I've been kind of coming up with this idea for a book and these ideas are coming through me. And I'm like, okay, I need to, I, I want to catalog them because these are all important. And if I'm in a place where I can't uh, document them, the small me says, oh, you're going to forget that. And then when I have that, fortunately right now, I see that as, and I see that with a little bit of a chuckle, like, no, no, it's it's within you. It's, 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 it's within you. And it may come out articulated in a different way, but it's within you. And this morning I told you, I woke up and had these ideas for the podcast and what I wanted to, how I wanted this thing to go and some questions I wanted to ask. And I'm like playing the conversation in my head and having a great time. And I'm like, Ooh, I want to remember to ask Boyd this particular question or that. And, and I, again, I had the awareness to kind of chuckle that there's no scarcity. Like this conversation is going to go exactly how it needs to. And if I don't get to some certain point, it's okay. And, and so I want to have this be a little bit of a segue into the work that, I mean, I'm just scratching the surface with, but you've done a lot of work with Byron Katie. And so this idea like, oh, scarcity. I think a lot of us have um, that come to us and the fear comes up. And, and the first thing, she would say is, is it true? Yeah. And so maybe uh, give us a little bit of, of, of background um, on her work and, and how it's impacted the way you've moved forward. Okay, um, so by way of a little bit of background, um, my, whole, my whole thing with the tracking model, what, well, what happened for me is, you know, I grew up as a tracker. I grew up following animals. This might be a little long way around, but I grew up we following. I got. I grew up following animals. Um, I grew up learning this ancient art form of how you put together the faint tracks of an animal as it moves across a landscape. How you teach yourself to see that track. How you teach yourself to go into the mindset of the animal. Um, and so I thought growing up, okay, I'm learning to be a tracker. And then when my life kind of through a series of traumas went into what I would call a frozen place when I became frozen. And, and we will get to, I want to unpack that later on. Okay. So we'll get to the trauma. So just hang on for that. Okay. So I went into a frozen place and then I met the first person who I'd call an inner tracker. She started to teach me how to heal. And this art form that I had grew, grow, grown up with, following lions, following animals, I started to see it differently. And what I started to see is that what she was teaching me about going inward, the mentality and the mindset of the tracker could teach us so much about that process of finding what we're actually looking for. And one of the things that she taught me very simply was to move towards what feels expansive in the body. So you start to move out of rationally what I should do. And as you bring yourself back to life, you just move towards what feels a little bit better. 
So you have to get in touch with feeling. You have to get in touch with like, oh, I noticed I get a little blip of like expansiveness in my chest there. So coming back to that somatic, and that was the first part of inner tracking was teaching yourself to see the track. And one of the ways of teaching yourself to see the track was to step towards feelings of expansiveness. Now, as that went on, you start saying like, oh, that feels better. I want to move towards that. I want to move towards that. Then here comes your first uh, limiting beliefs. You know, oh, that makes me feel really expansive. I want to move towards that. Oh, well, you, here comes the limiting belief. Oh, well, you can't do that. You know, no one has a career doing that. No one can live like that. You can't just do what you want all the time. You can't just, you can't just, you know, all these thoughts. And at that moment, Byron Katie, uh, as a teacher, started to enter my life. And what she developed after an awakening experience she had in 1984 was a very simple process of questioning your beliefs. Um, questioning the beliefs that were causing you suffering. And it just became, and, and it's not a place where you search for right or wrong. It's just a place where you meditate in a belief. And so, you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't make a living. Here comes a thought. Well, you can't make a living um, as a as someone who goes around talking about tracking. I mean, no one's ever done that. You can't study that. You can't get that job. I remember once... Um, uh, someone asking me, how did you get your job? You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah, um, you can't, there's no, you, you can't, there's no way in the culture that says you can do that. So I would like to make a living talking about tracking. Well, you can't do that. Okay. So what you would do is you would capture the thought. You can't make a living, uh, talking about tracking and then you would write it down. So it comes out of your head and onto paper, and you stay in one thought because there'll be a whole lot of sub ones that want to jump up. And that's important. Yeah. Write it down. You write and it down. Sit in, don't just sit with it. Meditate, as you said. And then the questions are, is it true? You know, and this voice will come up. Yeah, absolutely, it's true. No one's ever done that. <laughs> Can you absolutely know that it's true? And in the absolute, that's where it gets interesting. Like, well, I can't absolutely know. Who am I when I think the thought? And when I think the thought, I feel shut down. I don't know how to move forward. I feel um, afraid. I feel uncertain. Uh, I feel some anger that there's something I want to do that I don't know how to do it. And and as you sit in that, who am I when I believe the thought? You get to learn the egoic mind, you know, and you and you get to watch the mind itself, and that becomes absolutely critical. You can't. You invite the mind in, and you 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 ask it to rest in itself by being by watching it, as opposed to saying. Uh, you know, banish that thought. I can do whatever I want. You actually sit in it. Who am I when I believe that thought? I feel anxious. I feel uncertain how to move forward. Um, I feel frustrated. I feel stuck. I feel less than. Um, I feel like shut out of something I know I'm meant to do. I feel afraid. Some stuff comes up for me around money. You sit and you watch. And as you watch, you learn, you learn yourself. It's like you get a connection with the fearful, egoic side of yourself. Next question, who would I be without the thought? Oh, who would I be without the thought? You're sitting in meditation with it and you're writing all of this. I would feel relaxed. I would realize that I'm allowed to try anything. I would just start talking about tracking to people. I would... I would feel free. I would feel light. I would be willing to try. I would give myself the space to work out if that's a thing. I would, and then now you meet your true self. You meet your true nature. And then the final piece is um, the turnaround, where she says, "You take your original thought, and again, you explore the opposite." So, I can make a living talking about tracking. Well, how could that be more true? Well, people love hearing stories. Um, people are really interested in tracking. Um, there's people speaking about other stuff that's more random than tracking. Uh, you <laughs> nice. know, it's like suddenly there's like yeah. a possibility. Like um, I actually know some people who make livings talking about stuff that you would seem unrelated. In fact, now that I sit in it, I realize, you know, I know someone who talks about Olympic swimming and gets paid huge amounts of money. Now the mind is opening, you know, you're coming out of the... And, and just something about sitting in the thoughts starts to constellate an openness in the mind, not a right or a wrong or a just 
some exploration that creates a more open mind. Possibility. And out of that open mind, um, the opportunity for action, just, you don't have to take action. There's just possibility for yourself again. And action starts to sort of flow into it. So part of living as a tracker to me is, you know, at, at a certain point, as you start to identify what is calling you, what makes you expansive, what nourishes you, what makes you feel alive, um, and you want to start to move towards it, of course, what is going to happen is all the beliefs why you can't. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I've found Byron Katie to be the most effective. Mm -hmm. You know, not the be all and end all, but as the limiting mind comes in, mm -hmm. it's a very good system to question it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. And, and I think one thing is important to, to maybe touch on is it's one thing to, um, to move on those things that make you feel alive, that you're drawn to. I think the corollary to that is pay attention to those things where you actually contract because a lot of there's a lot more of those than the things we're called to. And unfortunately, we'll start to move on those things because we think it would be a good idea. It's because of everybody else's ideas around it. And so pay attention to the things when your body has a visceral reaction, like, oh fuck, I don't want to do that. It's like, yeah, don't do it. I mean, my you know, our whole thing in the tracking and the into tracking world is that there is a wild self inside of you. That wild self inside of you is it knows. It knows in the way that a leopard knows it's solitary. And it knows in the way a lion knows it belongs in the pride. And it knows in the way that a tree knows when to send out new leaves. You know, it's totally at one. Um, overlaying that is your social self, your socialized self. And we need a little socialized self to get through the world. But for most people, that socialized self starts to crush that wild self. Uh, it becomes so dense with this is what I have to do. This is what you should do. This is how you, and you, you'll know you're in it when you're really in deep have tos or shoulds. And one of the ways, as you start, as, as you reach a point in your life where you say, okay, what I've been doing, I'm at a transition. You know, I'm going through a change now. I'm transitioning out of a career. I'm tr I'm, something's changing in my relationship. We are all going to arrive at points in our life where we're transitioning. And mostly what people do is they try and rationally understand how to move forward. But when you reach the point where you know there's something you want to be fed in a different way, you want to be nourished in a different way, there's something that you want to be involved in that's, that's deeper than what you rationally should do. Well, then you need a different set of tracks to follow. You can't follow the track of what the culture offers you. You have to develop a different, in what, what we call in tracking, develop track awareness. You have to teach yourself to see a different path. And a big part of seeing that different path is going to come out of saying no to what the body constricts to and saying yes to what the body expands to because you're down in like your most essential biology there. You know, when you meet someone, like when you and I met, I just feel this like expansive energy, like, yes, yes, yes. You almost feel yourself going, yes, yes. And you're leaning forward in your chair saying something about this person. Yes. You know, and then you meet, you know, someone else and it's like, yeah. shut down. Yeah. And like only humans would would spend years overriding that in themselves, <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, I think one of the lines in, in the book is, <laughs> an animal never participated in a should, you know? We're the only people who walk over to an elevator and the door opens and there's some creepy character in there and, like, we make eye contact and step into it because it would have been polite to, like, see them and walk away in polite, <laughs> you know? Like, we override ourselves all the time. And so it's a very basic metric to just tune into that track in the body and just get into and start to follow that somatic for a while. And if you tune yourself to that, you will start making different decisions and your life will start going in different ways. And uh, the wheels will start popping off the vehicle too. You know, you'll pop a few wheel nuts because when you start saying, uh, when you start getting more essential, a couple of things are going to happen. Some people are going to really feel that authenticity building and they're going to be really attracted to you. And other people are going to be like, but wait, you know, this is how it's always been. And that's going to be, that's going to be some interesting work too. You're challenging a lot of the belief systems. You're challenging people who will take it personally. And it's, you know, I had, um, I was on a podcast recently and we were, it were talking about this exact thing through a different analogy, but it was like, you start to sing a different tune. You're in a different key. And people are going to look at you like, 
what is that fucking sound? I don't understand it. You're weird. You're off key. But others are drawn to it. And you're still singing your note. And then they come in and they fill in their notes. And, and, and it's this vibration changes on a different plane. And as you and as you change your inner, your outer will start to constellate differently. It just has to happen. Mm. And you start living towards the feeling. Um, and stepping away from all the shoulds, uh, you know, those, that to me is our big ones. Like what if you spend some time really paying attention to what makes you feel more alive and moving and simply moving towards that hot and cold that feels colder, that feels warmer, that feels warmer, that feels warmer. And then what if you said yes, when you meant yes and no, when you meant no, you know, just saying just that, if you just took that as an exercise, um, and said yes when you really got an inner yes and no when you got an inner no, that's going to start to change your life too. It's going to put you into an authenticity that uh, is going to connect you with yourself in a really deep way. And, you know, pe people are going to battle with probably. Yeah, so I would recommend everybody just hitting the back button here and just and really maybe even slowing it down to half speed and just listen to what Boy just said there because it's so fucking true. It's so simple. When, when your body says no, just act on it. Don't worry about being rude or impolite or these social graces. That it, it, That's all bullshit. That's all old programming. Like you said, we've spent so much time trying to override that system. Get back in touch with that system, that intuition, whatever you want to call it, the gut feeling. It's, it's, it's whatever it means to you, but tap into that. And so I, I love that, that you kind of just put it that, that simply. Oh, and if you... you if you arrive at a juncture, and this is, I would say I meet like maybe 80% of people who I work with are, they're at a change, they're at a transition, something has happened. And they are aware that what they've been doing or the way they've been doing it is no longer working. Um, you know, they may have the feeling of being in like Groundhog Day. They may have the feeling of like, rolling out this version of themselves that, that is, you know, it's just been, it almost feels like they're in an act of themselves. They've been doing the same thing for so long. And yeah. yet there's this impulse, like it's, I'm, I now want to do something differently. And that's where, and one of the things that comes up there is, well, when I know exactly what it is, I'll go and do it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, well, when, and, and often it's a thing, you know, like when I know exactly what the next job is, when I know exactly what the next... But the, the tracker, the tracker's inclination, all tracking begins with going without knowing, being willing to start and, and paying attention again and tuning back in because the thing that you are looking for, it's not going to be a thing, you know, or really it is. Some people do find it's not going to be a thing. It's going to be a different way of living and a different way of living that comes out of a different set of metrics and a different way of living that will come in my language towards discovering the authentic track of your life. And that is not a place you'll ever arrive. That will be a way that you consistently learn to live. Um, and the cool thing is it's super unique for everyone. <laughs> and one of the things that happens is, is if you say, I'm, you know, I'm stuck. I don't know what I'm meant to be doing. I don't know what the next thing is. That's okay. Now I'll start to pay attention. And weirdly things start to if you just start to pay attention, attention is the discipline of the tracker. And attention, just paying attention will start to show you, oh, that feels a little better. Oh, that feels a little, I'm oh, more like that, more like that. And tiny steps towards that are going to start to pull you into a different life. Okay, so my fucking, I'm on <laughs> fire right now. It's like every sentence that comes out, it's like, oh my gosh, there's a whole tributary we can go down. And, and so a, a lot of a lot of thoughts. I love this. This is so good. It's going to be so hard to pick clips to put on social media for this episode because you've just nugget after nugget. So thank you. It's going to make my job easy and difficult, which is beautiful because that's the whole Buddhism thing. But, um, oh shit. Like we, I, th I think we spend so much time ruminating. And what you're talking about is just get present to find out what feels good. And, and I think those are the all the practical things where you learn about mindfulness, whether it's meditation, through walking, through sitting, 
getting in cold water, stills you, whatever that method is. Those are great protocols to get you into some sort of presence so that you can start to tap into these ideas about yourself. Um, I remember one of the the things that, that I really gained when I was on retreat is I sat down with you and Braun in a private session and I wasn't going to go do it. Uh, just I'm like, oh, I feel good. And this has been amazing. And my roommate, John was like, dude, you should totally go do it. Like, and so one thing led to another and we sat down and sure enough, like I got just great teachings. And one of the, the biggest was just this idea of the next track and I expressed to both of you, I said, you know, I really want to write this newsletter. I think I'm pretty good at writing and I'm really struggling. I haven't found my voice. Like I have the concepts of what I want to write about, but it's just, it's not right. And you're just like, well, do you have to do it? And I'm like, no, I was like, oh, oh, then, then, then don't do it. What, what, like, what do you enjoy doing? I'm like, I fucking love the podcast. I love sitting down and connecting and it's real easy. They're like, oh, you're like, yeah, just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not your gift. And so just stay on that as your next track and, and then pay attention, as you said, be aware of what the next track may be. And then sure enough, recently I found the voice for the newsletter because I wasn't looking for it anymore. And so I appreciate that, but I, I, I loved your insight there. Sometimes, you know, just the simplicity of, you know, for me, it's like, go where the energy is, you know, go where the energy is. And, and in that case, it's not to say that there's not a place to, to struggle, you know, there's not a place to push. Um, but you could just feel in that moment, what was being asked of you, uh, and your idea about what you should be doing. Were, should. That, that's what it was. It was, it was like, I'm really passionate to do this thing and I really should be doing this newsletter. And that's where it lost energy for me. If you had said to me, like, I know in my soul, I feel called to the newsletter. I want to get it out. Um, but I, I just feel like the words aren't right, but I know I'm, I know I'm meant to be doing it. I would say, keep going, just keep iterating. You'll get there. But it was so clear that it was coming out of a, a different place, you know? Yeah. Other people have been with podcasts have done it and I've liked it. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. this is a that's great... how you do it. That's yeah. the model. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's like build, we, we're being asked to build our own models at the moment. But you know, the other thing about it is what's what's amazing is, I mean, even you know, a few minutes ago I had a conversation. It's so often you you have that conversation with someone, you know, I have no idea what I'm meant to do. No idea what I'm meant to do. Um but and then they'll say something like, but I, you know, I was fascinated at the moment with um with knife making. Or there's always something in there that starts to emerge. And they keep saying, I don't know what I'm meant to do. And then they'll say, but, I'm, but I've actually been, been crafting these things lately or whatever it is. And I'm not, I'm not saying that well. But what I'm saying is, is that when people start to tune in, something very unique starts to emerge for them. And actually, often it's there. There's just the willingness to follow it a little bit and see where it wants to take them. Mm, yeah, that was, <laughs> I know exactly what you're referring to. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. So I referred to it earlier. L let's talk a little bit about, um, yeah, it was really a series of traumas that you and the family kind of experienced. Um, that, that again, I think is, is a, is a great example of these things aren't happening to me. They're happening for me. And it's not that you necessarily invite these things, um, that are objectively like not good. Mm -hmm. Um, but, if, if we can look at all of this as, as a way to move us through the world and to, and to provide learning and information. And, and so, well, I mean, what I've become aware of is trauma that is, that is healed and processed becomes medicine. You know, what, what we go through and while we're going through it, we can even begin to understand this, that there we are being given something in those moments that we will be, a, that will become part of our medicine in the world. And so for me, I had, I had some encounters, one, um, and I would say the one that was most probably most difficult in some level was that when I was 18, my family was attacked at a time when South Africa was very unstable. 
And myself and my sister and my mother and a teacher we had at the time were taken into what you would, would a home invasion situation, a hostage situation, tied up, um, people in your home with guns told you're going to get killed. And there was something incredibly freezing for an 18 year old boy of looking around the room and seeing the woman in your family tied up at gunpoint. And, you know, the way that those were going down at that time was, was pretty violent. Um, so that had a, it had a huge impact on me. Uh, it, there was something about that experience that was absolutely freezing in some ways. Um, looking back on it, there was, there was a, a a miraculous energy at work in that room. You know, there was somehow myself and my sister and my mother and this woman who was with us, we went into a very deep kind of presence in some ways. And in fact, towards the end of uh, the experience, they actually took me outside and they told me we were taking you outside to kill you. We're going to shoot you. Um, and I remember going outside with them and I remember getting the gun put to my head and looking down uh, the sort of the barrel at this young guy who was on the other end of it, this guy who was clearly traumatized himself and who, who came from severe trauma. And in a weird moment, uh, we looked at each other and there was just this incredible connection that traveled between us. Um, and Cal, I mean, I don't really know how to describe it, but like after in that moment, it was like the, it was like the energy field around us just got dense and everything, um, everything just kind of stopped. And there was this like weird moment where they, these guys who had come into the house just sort of stood around. It, it was like everyone got glimmered and like no one understood really what was going on. And then I picked up some car keys and I handed it to them and they just left. It was incredibly like odd. And in some ways, what I realized much later is that part of what took longer to integrate than the fear that happened during those hours was the scope of what also happened in that moment. You know, the scope of the way the mystery bent reality in that, in that moment between him and I. So, so that was the first one. Uh, about, a, about a year after that, I was down in the river uh, in at Londolozi and I sat down on the edge of the riverbank and I thought I could see the water was clear running over sand, sat down, my legs were dangling in front of me. I had my tracker Solly with me. We had a few guests with us. Um, and the sandbank fell away slightly and where the sandbank fell away. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a crocodile go down in water, but you can see it, you can see it, you can see it. And then suddenly you can't, you know, it's like, it's like a little depth thing. Like it's okay. a few inches between where you can see a croc and where you can't. Oh, really? And I thought it's shallow enough here that I could see, but he had the necessary two or three inches. Fuck. And so he was, he was just out of the range of where I could see. Sitting on the edge of the river, croc came out. My legs were dangling in front of me, grabbed me by the leg, um, went to pull me in. As he went to pull me in, I threw my arm up and I grabbed a branch and I started shouting at the people who were standing sort of in the shallow water around, get out, get out the fucking water, move, move. So they got out. Um, Croc went to bite me a second time. My foot went down his throat. He spat me out and I pulled myself up into the tree. And I remember this feeling of like non-locality. I remember seeing myself being, seeing myself from the outside, pulling myself up into the tree. And as I came out the water, the calf just totally opened and was sort of cleaved off and hanging off from the one side. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the, like, from here down, like pretty mangled. Mm. Got across onto the bank. My tracker arrived, and this was pretty much one of the most amazing moments in the story. He arrived at the deep section of the channel between, and he, he saw me on the bank, then there was the river, then there was him. And he knew because he could see that there was a croc in there somewhere and he just came straight into that channel and crossed the water, crossed that channel to get to me, grabbed me and he pulled me up onto the bank. When I got up onto the bank, this, this voice, my uncle's voice started running in my head. When I was a kid, my uncle would drop me in a rapid in the river and I get washed down and he'd grab me. He would go wait down and he'd grab you and pull you out. And once he missed me, I got washed down the river. And when he eventually got me out, (laughs) 
I was like shaking. I was a little kid, you know, I was crying. And he said to me, buddy, uh, whatever happens in the bush, you never panic. When you panic, your brain turns into sponge. You got to be cool. So you got to handle things. So I, so I get up onto the bank, mangled leg, shocked looking guests all around. And I hear this, <laughs> I hear this voice in my head, buddy, don't let your brain turn to sponge. And, and it's, you know, true, true as nuts, you know, so to calm myself down, like put myself into, okay, we gotta, we gotta operate now. Tracker gave me a shirt, put the shirt around my leg, got everyone, calmed them down, called my own medivac in, uh, got myself and got myself out of there. But you know, something, another creature tries to eat you. It's a kind of a rare experience in modern life. Mm -hmm. Uh, it goes into your psyche. And so I had that on the back end of and the one thing that I often think about, and maybe, I don't know if this is related, but like one of the things about animals is animals are honest. Like a lion tells you 100% clearly with its body language where the boundaries are, its mood, how it feels. Crocodile's honest. You come in the water, he's going to try and eat you. <laughs> um, that experience with the people, you know, that was weird for me because I, I didn't know what they would do one moment to the next. Like I couldn't work out what the game was, you know? Um, so I always think about that. Anyway, those two things that happened and that, that started to really freeze me. Um, but later in my life, after I had, after I'd been through some healing, and then there was one other thing which involved a court case sort of thing, which is a whole long story, which is probably in some ways the hardest thing. But when I started to get into the healing arts, one of the things that I realized is when, when I went to a group, into a group to run a ceremony, or when I started working with a person individually, um, very unconsciously, when we met and started to, to talk, they could feel that there were some places I had been. You know, there were some edges that I had been to. And so they knew how far they could go with me. And so that became, and I worked a lot with people who had had particularly uh, violent trauma. And when I unconsciously, you know, it's very unconscious when you're working with that sort of stuff. They could sense like, okay, I can fully let go here. I can, I can go, I can bring this thing up because this guy can hold it because he's, he's seen it. He's been there. He knows that. Um, people who had, you know, in some ways had to survive, you know, I'd been to that edge. Um, and so that became, it became a kind of medicine for me. Those things became gifts for me and they became my work. I was, I was mentored, very well mentored by this incredible healer who was a woman. She taught me the feminine. She taught me how to, how to feel, how to be gentle, how to let the feeling guide. But then those experiences from my early life meant that I was able to connect with the masculine, you know, in a way that I had been places that allowed me to, to work with men in a very unique way. Yeah, so, so our traumas become our medicines our traumas, the places, and, and that and doesn't necessarily have to be violent. The places where we've been most lost, the places where we've been most stuck, um, they become, they become, we start to have the maps for those places. You know, like, so when I think of you and, you know, how incredibly successful you were in the space of career and how deep you went into like making it in the world and you've been there, you've done it. And then you realize that, there was something you had done, but there was, you wanted to live in a different way. It wasn't feeding you anymore. It wasn't nourishing you. There was something calling you. And so you've started this journey of, of letting go of that and finding a new way. But what's amazing is that you have been to that place. You've been to the peaks of that place. You've been to the pinnacle of that world. And so for a lot of people who are, who are deep in in building a career, in building a traditional career, deep in the worlds that you've been in, you're going to have, you know, a map out of that. Uh, and so the, these are, this is how we, and this is why we need all of us. This is why n there's no one great, you know, person. This is why we need the we consciousness, because when we come together, we bring together all these different maps of our lives. And if we've done our inner work, we're conscious enough um, to say, hey, I have the map for that one for you. I have the map for that one for you. Mm -hmm. And we start, and that is where, that is why we have to, we have to gather more. We have to come together. We have to build community so we can share the maps of healing and see each other um, and offer our journeys to each other uh, with no, with no advice. Just this has been my journey and that becomes the medicine, you know? Mm, so that's beautiful. For Vaughn, I just want to point out what, 
what you describing your experience and in why you are able to hold that space for people. You, I mean, it's the classic wounded healer, and I think that there is. There are a lot of people out there who've done their studying and they know the terms and, but when someone goes to them, they just know it's falling flat because they don't, they don't actually know. They know about these experiences, but they don't know them. And the places that you've been, the places that I've been, they're experiences that you can't read about, or you sure can read about, but you will never know them until you actually live them. And I think that that's such a, it's such an authentic place to come from. And you can tell when you meet a person who has that and they're not trying to sell you anything. They are sharing their story in a way that you want more. Tell me more, tell me more. I can put myself in your story because it's an authentic story and I can see where there are similarities and differences and where it's resonating. Tell me more, tell me more. Don't tell me what to do. I think we've all spent time telling, giving people advice and it, and it just doesn't work. It needs to come from within. Yeah, It's that mirror or however you want to kind of, whatever the analogy is, but it's, it's setting the container for someone to find themselves in the story. And so it's not just telling them your story, but it's telling them in a way that really speaks to them and it's authentic and it's raw and it's open. And because we, we all know these people who tell their story and they're super successful and there's never any hardship. It's like, that's bullshit. Yeah. No, I mean, I know ne- I never really met anyone who, uh, who it was all plain sailing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Never. Um, but there's such an opportunity to, to discover your own medicine inside of that. Yeah. 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 And I think that's, I think that's what I probably learned the most. Well, there's a lot of things. There's no, nothing I've learned the most, but it, it's, it's really, it's allowing people the space to tap into their own medicine. And I'm thinking now too about, you know, my, what I've found is that people who find the authentic track, what you might call the authentic track, like there's some characteristics that come with it to me. Um, one, there's a natural inclination towards simplicity. Mm-hmm. There's a deep desire that, em- that seems to emerge towards experience over stuff. Um, there's an, a natural inclination towards creativity, like the desire to just create things for the joy of it. Um, there's a pull towards service, touching other people's lives becomes... Um, and then... There's a, there's a deep allure towards nature again, you know, just wanting to be in nature becomes absolutely critical to the, in, to wanting to be immersed in the concentric fields of intelligence that nature is. Um, and then I believe that those people are trackers, you know, to me, I call them the tribe of forgotten trackers, because mm-hmm. once those things start to take root out of the authentic track inside, you start to live differently. Mm-hmm. And that living differently, it's a kind of activism. And it's an activism that does not hold placards or shout or go against anything. Um, It's an activism that just says out of the contentment and fullness of aliveness, this is how I'm going to live. And people see that. And usually what happens is an originality to it because you're moving towards something that's unique to you. You make up a different way of living, you know, how, how did you get that job? You make up a different way of living mm. and your life makes it possible to live differently. And that is the activism of this time. We have to learn to live differently. And I think that the collective consciousness shift we're looking for is a lot of people getting in touch with that. A lot of individuals, and that's what the, the end of the book sort of lands on, is a lot of people getting in touch with that authentic life. Um, as someone who's passionate about nature, that's where the shift in our relationship with nature will come because we just stop wanting more stuff and that will start to really change things. And I think that the one thing that the environmental models don't account for, in my opinion, is a mass human awakening. You know, that's where the algorithm can fire totally differently. If a lot of people start waking up and go towards simplicity, connection, presence, um, as they are for experience, as what's actually calling them, 
you know, this thing starts to shift. And there's a great quote, which I love. The, the system expects revolution. It doesn't expect abandonment, mm. you know, and it, there's a certain kind of, I'm not going to try and fight the system. I'm just going to live like this. And a lot of us going down that path, yeah. that starts to change things in an interesting way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, I love that. <laughs> wow. Abandonment rather than revolution. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, I mean, you're speaking to what I'm experiencing right now is just this different way of living. And to be frank, it's really resonating with a lot of people, a lot of men in particular, who are just looking for a new way. They don't want the seven steps to financial success and all the bullshit. It's, it's not, these aren't step programs. Um, I mean, and do you find, cause you don't, I'm going to be super interested in your experience on this. You don't have to convince anyone. They just start feeling it on you. You know, if you, if, if you're in that authentic path, if you're on your authentic track, they just feel it on you. And, and they, something in them is just drawn to it. You don't have to say like, this is how you should be doing it. You know? Well, so that, you, yeah, well, that brings to mind. Um, so I started, I set up these Zoom calls with a group of eight or ten buddies, and I'm like, okay, I want to get used to facilitating groups. I want to have conversations, and these are all my brothers. Like, this is a way for us to stay connected when we're in different areas versus yeah. text. And so, one of the calls I had sent out um, a web page of this like hyper-masculine, go fuck this, kill your dreams, do like just, yeah, yeah. it was just so over the top, hyper-masculine, toxic, all that. And I said, what comes up for you with this? And so we have this conversation around it. And one of my friends asked a great question. He goes, so how do you convince people that your way is better than this? And I said, oh, there's no convincing. They can go do that. I've done that. Like, absolutely, go that path back to your point. The path of not here is part of the path of here. And so go there and understand for yourself that that's going to create certain amount of changes in you or not. And then eventually you'll stumble upon my message and my mission because I'm just living it. I'm not trying to sell anything. And then you'll say, how can I get more of you? I'll listen to the podcast or hire me as a coach, or read the book that I'm putting out. Like, it's just, you just yeah. put it out there. Well, they might they might watch you, and they might watch you, like, inside an intense gym session, you know? And then they might watch you, <laughs> at, like, going full on, you know, really pushing the, the edge there. Then they might watch you being able to be absolutely tender with your children and mm -hmm. totally connected. And then they might watch you being able to really um, go go there with your wife. And then they might watch you like go away on a boys weekend and go, you know, and, and be in whatever that, 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 that frequency was. And that's where you don't have to convince anyone because it just starts to become obvious that you have access to more life. And that to me is the difference between power through dominance. Like I'm, I was going to fucking muscle everything. Yes. You know, and fucking like own everything. <laughs> and like, you know, when all you've got is a hammer, everything's a nail. Like yes. we're just going to hit everything. It's like power through presence is like, what does this moment, what's this moment asking of me? Okay. You want intensity? Boom. I have access to it. You want gentleness? Boom. I have access to yeah. it. This moment needs like absolute vulnerability and heart. I can go there. This moment needs me to harden the fuck up and push. I can go there. And that to me is the dynamic. And it, it, I don't think it works just having access to what is heralded, like the push, 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 do, 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 feel nothing, push through mentality. I respect it. There's a place for it, mm -hmm. you know, but it has to be balanced by the ability to go the other way. Yeah. And that's where presence to me is just like, and that to me is lions, you know, you just watch the lion just lie there and in the deepest state of rest. And there's no thinking, I wish I, sh I should be more of this. I, I missed that kill yesterday. We didn't just deep rest, boom. 11, 12, 13 hours, deep rest. Temperature changes, wake up, time to hunt, boom, absolute intensity. You know, um, time to eat, whole pride fights with each other, Brr, getting at food. Finished with that, time to bond, whole pride connects with each other. It's just pure presence. What is the moment asking for? Male lion, you see him lying there, cubs rolling around on his head. 
Another male comes in the territory, stand up, rip and power march over there and get in a fight. You know, yeah. that's it. It's just what is being asked. Yeah, it's like having that, that ability to be discerning. So to be able to wear the different, you know, the archetypes, right? The warrior, the lover, the king, whatever yeah. those are and however they manifest for you. But, you know, I spent so much of my life in that warrior mentality. And, um, and so I say this to all those men out there and women who, who feel like they've been going down that way. Don't apologize for it. Just accept that that's where you've been. And now that you're hearing this and it's creating an awareness in you, like be grateful that that's, Oh, yeah. okay. I don't have to just be that and guy. Awesome. Got that gear ticked. You know, you've yeah. developed it. Yes. Like that's a great one that you've got now. Yeah. Want to develop a few others? Yeah. Like that's where the, that's where it's great. You know, there's no, there's, there's no better. No. It's just, and what will keep you out of your presence? What will keep you out of the ability to move seamlessly between different encounters that life is asking for? The role that you have assigned yourself, provider, uh, leader, strong one. Yeah. The um, rock for the family. The rock. The role will keep you out of that. Mm -hmm. Your trauma will keep you out of that. In the past, it wasn't safe to, um, when I opened up, it was dangerous. There was no place to open up in my house or, you know, so you want more presence in your life, which is actually what you're looking for. You know, almost, I would say almost hundred percent of the time, if you're in a life change, you may be looking for some, maybe thinking I'm looking for the next thing to make me feel that what you're actually looking for is more presence always. Um, and that's why the, the journey, it can be supported by outer practices certain things will be relationally more supportive to who you fundamentally are, but ultimately it's going to be working out what roles you stuck in what and what traumatized you and what, what those experiences, what patterns they constellated. And awareness of those will naturally start to move them and then comes more presence. Mm. But for men, the role, the role is the one that, and they actually know in, in family systems, the definition of a functional family is that people in the family can change roles. And the definition of a dysfunctional family is no one can. So the provider rock can never let himself be taken care of, you know? And, that, Dude, and that's what starts to create the dysfunction. Ding, ding, ding. That I lived that for so fucking long. Yeah. Not because they told me, it's because that's no, what you, I you believe. You took it on. Yes. Yeah, and, and also, you know, we take these things on honestly. And, you, and our role and our role and our trauma, they, uh, the trauma kept us safe at a time, you know, so it's not. Awareness is up. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just like, ah, oh, to be dynamically free and, and to be able to feel freely and at times to know that I have to temper the feeling here to, to push something to me, it's, to me, that's the, the, well, the dynamicness in which I'm trying to live. You know, access to the softness, access to the hardness, access to to all of the the myriad experiences that life offers. More life, more yeah. presence is more life. Yeah, and in, and in, in, so just thinking back on kind of my journey through this this place, it's um, you know, what I say to anybody out there: be patient. Learn what you need to learn, read the books, listen to podcasts like this to like get the ideas and concepts, start start playing with them and, and, and be patient because you'll start to get it and then you'll quote unquote, fuck it up. It, 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 takes, it takes a long time and you have to just hold yourself in that space of being okay because you're doing the best you can to change. And through my experience, you know, I haven't, I've been retired for the past, six plus years. I've been around the family. I've been here. I've been present in, in a physical sense. I'm now present in a deeply emotional and spiritual sense in a way that, you know, you talk about being the rock and the provider. Um, I didn't let Peyton in. And in a lot of ways, I didn't let the kids in because I had to be a certain way, I thought. And, you know, as I've been on this journey and as I've let go, I mean, the, the kids, they all give me shit for all the things that I'm doing, but 
each one of them, I'm connected to them in a way that I, I honestly never thought I could be. Like it is, it is life changing. It, it's so hard to describe because I didn't know that this was possible. And it's, they're still young. You know, they're still, we're still just developing these relationships. And, you know, I have this shirt on today. If you're listening, you can't see it, but it's a picture of me and it says the working in, it says working in podcast. And this is what hope got me for my birthday. And this is back when the podcast was called working in. And it was just, this is her nature. This is, she's so tender and loving and I've never been closer to her. I mean, it, it's something that it, it's not just words. Um, I'm so grateful for that. My son, Jake, who just, you know, finished his junior year of basketball and I had sent him a text that was just like, man, like, I'm like, like, thank you. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to watch you play and just the way you it's not about scoring points. It's like the way he shows up for his teammates. He fucking loves his teammates. I'm so grateful for that. And then the message he wrote back never, ever intimated this to me before. He's like, thanks, Dad. I know I don't say it, but I love it. I love that you're there for my games. I don't care, you know, you don't care where it is that you're always there. And it's so interesting because I would say, hey, buddy, when's the next game? And it was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be flying back and then I'll, and I'll be at your game. He's like, dad, don't worry, you don't have to come. But he really wants me there. And so I could think about it and be like, oh, it's okay. It wasn't too long ago. I would have been like, oh, okay, I'll just come back later. But I know, I just have a knowing that I want to be there and he wants to be there. And so, you know, our son Bowen, who's 14 and in this phase where he's really finding himself and it's, you know, like he's, he and Peyton are, you know, my wife are, are, are kind of oil and water right now, but, but I just have a different understanding about him right now. And we are, again, just like, it's not like I just let him get away with stuff, but I just have an understanding of where he's at and what he needs to do for his process. And he's just really drawn to me right now. And so I just have these relationships with the kids. And honestly, it's silly, but even with our two dogs and our pet pig petunias, like I have so much love for them that it's, it's just, you know, if I can be an example to people, just be patient with yourself because there was a time for, for a, an extended period where I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with me? I want to be all these things, but I can't. I can't. I don't have the capacity to love like I feel like I should be loving. And I just stayed with it and I tried different ways to learn about it. And, and it's finally here. And, and I, it's, worth, it's worth it. You tracked it, you know? Yeah. You tracked it. You, and it's and that's the thing. It's not like the heart doesn't just always open like that. You know, when it's been guarded, when you've been in the role, when you've it takes time, attention, awareness. But then, like, what's beautiful to me about what I'm hearing you say is, um, again, it comes to that sense of activism without activism. Like, you're laying the table for a different experience for your kids. You know. And that's where I see like when one person heals, it starts to affect things. And some of, some of our, our thinking in this culture is like, I want to feel good, you know, but some of our, what we should be thinking is like the generations after us are going to learn from how we are. You know, and that's actually where this, you know, the shot, the real shot of change is probably in a generation, two generations from now, if people start to really open in this way and live in this way. And you know, I, I can't tell you how many people, uh, I, every single, probably every single person I've ever worked with, you know, there's that the piece around not being fully con able to connect or talk with the people who raised them. That's like a part of the deal. So to start to develop that type of openness, it's just incredible. Yeah. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. To, for you to, to just live it, you know, live it. 
live inside of that kind of heart and that kind of openness, that's going to travel, you know? Yeah, no. And I think, I think that's, that's beautiful. And, um, and again, I, I think I want to just point out, I don't want this to get lost in all the tears, but when your kids or your wife or your husband or partner or whatever says like, they'll, yeah, yeah, my kids make fun of all of this shit that I'm doing, but they yeah. see, did you hear Bowen last night talking about when I was doing, I was working in the grid league with the fitness league and he's like, you were so busy and you were stressed and it was either you were in that or you were playing cribbage with me and Jake, but it was like, it was palpable to him. This was four, five, six years ago. And he's just like, in essence saying, that's not who you are anymore. Yeah. And so grateful. And it's great that they tease you about it. You know, yeah. dad's heart's open. He's always crying. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. But the bottom line is, is the feeling that they're growing up in is one of openness and one of, of warmth and one of presence. And, and in some ways that's the feeling in the house, you know? Yeah, for sure. I always think like, one of the things that kids grow up in the energy field of the house and it doesn't really matter what you say or do to them. The feeling in the house is the thing that they'll really absorb. And, you know, the kind of openness coming out of you and Peyton is, you know, that's, that's gonna, it's gonna be fascinating and beautiful to see how that shapes them. Yeah. And well, yeah. and it was, it was two short years ago, Jake was a freshman at Westlake High School here. And uh, there was an energetic um, disconnect between Peyton and I that was pretty significant. It Again, you hear it all the time. Well, we never fight and we never do this in front of the kids. And it's like, we never really fought either, but there was, a, there was something that was palpable that the kids picked up on. And Jake in particular, like really struggled in school that year and he was sick a lot and these other things were coming up and in in looking back right using hindsight it's like oh that was not entirely caused by us but that contributed to what he like that's these kids pick up on all this so just because you're not yelling and screaming in fact if you are yelling and screaming that might be better for them because they can actually see it i mean the the like there's kind of like the two ends of the scale and both are probably as dangerous the one is the house that is unsafe and a house that is pretending it's safe yes you know and both of those have you know consequences they're pretty serious consequences i mean how many people have you worked with and, and, and i'm just starting to work with people but i've had a number of people there's something there's something off with their relationship and they're like you know but we never fight and i'm just like you fucking aren't connected. It's like, it's not, the fighting isn't the red flag. I mean, it's a red flag, but there are a hundred, a thousand other reasons why there's something going on. So don't just look at that as being the thing. Uh, I mean, not not fighting is the same thing. Like t too much fighting. It's just like, you're just <laughs> burying yeah. it. Checked out. Yes, <laughs> you know? completely. Yeah, the yeah, ap just, apathetic. Yeah. And, oh, okay. Just dialing it in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so interesting. Yeah. So if you're listening there and you don't fight with your wife or pick your husband, fight. yeah, yeah, pick a fight and see what happens. <laughs> but yeah, like it can be just be this like these little mini traumas that you're just burying, 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 and eventually they have to come out. And and I, well, you and I were talking about this on the car ride from the airport yesterday, but you know, uh, Peyton and I, we had a marriage ceremony a year and a half ago down in Mexico. And it's this beautiful Mayan ceremony. And one of the things that we discussed and, and kind of quote unquote agreed upon was that we have forgiven each other for kind of how we'd been in the past. And we are taking on, as you said, new roles. And I think that's beautiful that you had said that. It's like immediately you thought, yeah, like we have different roles and we're not the same people we were when we got married 20 years ago. So like, why pretend that we're in those roles? And so it's this beautiful thing and we just were really excited about it. And yesterday there was a, a moment where something triggered her from a past behavior of mine. Now, I would say I'm not in that 
system anymore. Um, and it was really, if just to be frank, it was, I didn't see her. I really didn't. I had my blinders on. It was all about me for any number of reasons. And there was so much about her that I was missing. And so that's not the case anymore, but there was something I said that back in the day would have triggered that. And so it did trigger this. And so we had this weird exchange. I didn't really know what to do with it because from my point of view, I didn't really do anything wrong. So she comes in 30 minutes later and apologizes and said, I want to start fresh. And as we start to unpack it, she's like, this thing just came out and I know it shouldn't um, because you don't deserve this. And I'm like, well, the fact of the fact is that it did come out. And so there's more work that that just needs to come out. And, and it's okay, even though we made this agreement a year and a half ago that we were going to forgive each other, and your intentions were great, and my intentions are great around that. We start fresh, but you still have to like tease that trauma out in in whatever way you can. And I'm just grateful that I can receive it in a way that not too long ago, I'd have been like, fuck her. Like she's she's all fucked in the head. She's got to go deal with this. Where I'm like, there's no defense. No, it's like, babe, no, like I'm not going anywhere. Please like feel what you need to feel and we'll work through it. And thanks for communicating it. But it's this idea that even though we want it to be a certain way, we still need to work through these things. Mm -hmm. That's She spent a lot of years trying to deal with it herself and bury it and just grind through it. And, and it can get you a certain way, but that bill always needs to come due and be paid. And I think that that was just my medicine was like, just sit with this. Can you sit with this? Yeah. And, and you know, you're in the dialogue. You're in the dialogue. I think, I think being in the dialogue again, same thing is like being in the dialogue is, is so rich. And I think where people really struggle is where they, is where this, they can't even get to that. You know, there's no dialogue. And sometimes that's because first work has to be going done individually again. So that, you know, to, to sort of, when it's not happening in the relationship to go and work it out a bit more in, in the self and then bring it back to the relationship becomes important. That was uh, our work. And yeah. we've, we've talked about this and we'll sit down and kind of, you know, unpack that for people, but that very thing you just talked about. We we had to do our own work. Yeah. And then come back to the relationship and own our 50% and then see what it looks like. Yeah. But but don't just try to fix the relationship if if you've got all your shit. No, sometimes it's very private. You gotta go and do and and respect the relationship enough that like we gotta go do some get to get to under some of the layers of what needs to be moved individually so that when we come back to dialogue sometimes you know there's that feeling of there's just like this perspex between you like you're you're trying to connect but it just it doesn't feel like it ever happens mm -hmm. and and that to me is a place where sometimes it's to step away to go in and then come back to see if you can get something more real to, to sort of like spark again yeah and i yeah. think and i think in that process uh, you know for some of us, for me, like it's happening almost like unconsciously or subconsciously. And, and so it's misconstrued as, oh, he's just going to, he's back into himself and going down that road again, where a lot of times we don't even know what's going on. We just know we need to go investigate this piece that is ourself and so if you're feeling like you're alienating your partner or whatever, and you feel like you're doing the work, like that may be the thing. And so maybe just put some words to that for them to maybe have a better understanding because I wasn't doing that for a while. And I, I was just following what I knew I needed to do, but I wasn't aware of what I was doing. And so I was having a really hard time articulating it. And it seemed like the same old thing, but it was a very different thing. And so that might help uh, release a little bit of tension in the relationship. If, if you can, you maybe use my experience as, as a little bit of a uh, background for what you may be going through. But I think, yeah, do your own work and, um, and however it looks, you're not going to go down the same path as your partner. In fact, it's your path. And so maybe use the tools that Boyd is suggesting, or I'm suggesting, or other people that you're learning from, 
pull them in and see what works for you, but don't be married or attached to any of them. Just whatever is working best for you. I mean, the other one that I see a lot of is, you know, the idea in the culture is like, okay, the relationship should give us everything. And then you just reach a point where, you know, because of the way that modern life is, there's, there's actually nothing, there's nothing to bring to the relationship. It's, it's spent. And you have to go individually and go and like gather some more life separately that you can bring back, you know, sort of actually go and do some living for yourself, build up some energy for yourself and bring it back. And people are, people are so afraid of that. They think, well, if we're going to do our own things, it must mean we're disconnecting. It's like, no, like sometimes that moving apart can be to, to create more connection, but it's outside the cultural model again, you know? Yeah. And I've often thought, um, so you take that idea that your partner, your spouse, your soulmate, whatever the fuck people want to call it, should be the thing that completes you and that they can, they can, you know, bring in all those parts in, in, in they can. And so I used to think, well, you have other people in your life that fulfill those roles. And I, and I do believe that on some level, but when I really think into it, it's the first time I've thought about this. And it, just cause you brought it up, it's like, it's all within us. We have to, we have to truly believe that we are complete, that we're perfect, not in the sense that there's nothing, you know, we're, we're like perfectly imperfect, but we we have everything we need and that these other things are just in, back in relation to us. But it's not that I need this person to fulfill this role and this person to fulfill that and this person to do that. It's, 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 it's all need, it, it needs to come from deep within you. And it takes time, I think, to get there. But I think that that is the 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 journey worth taking is the inner journey. The, the and I think that's a lot of what you're talking about is going inward, finding those tracks until you get to who you are, the core of who you are beneath all those roles. Yeah, that's where the the authentic life, you know, mm. so with the path of the tracker, uh, go without knowing, you know, start the process without knowing exactly where you're gonna go. Um, teach yourself to see your track, tune into your body, that the piece around expansive, expanding, um, develop your track awareness. So you start to know that's for me, that's for me, that's for me. Um, understand you'll lose the track. Like 100% you're going to lose the track out there. When you lose the track, go back to where you were last clearly, clearly on track or try some things. This is a big one. Like the, I, so many people, when they lose the track, they'd be frozen, but a, a good tracker just starts trying. They look up there, some open ground there. They check a game part there, try some things again, um, as quick as you can, never track alone, you know, get some, get some people around you who can support you in that journey. Not um, an echo chamber, not folks, an, not an echo chamber, but people who aren't going to sell you their fears, you know, people who can say like, keep, keep going, keep tracking. Um, and, and if you do that, that's, you know, that's the model and that's the model. Stay inside of that. I think and, that, well, again, yeah. And that, and that just paying attention to those things and all of that is just tied together by being present, being present, being present. Well, I think that's a perfect segue into your new book. And now I don't know if you need to sell any more copies cause I I've, I've handed out <laughs> almost 50 copies and I have another 15 or so to go. Um, but your book has been in amongst my group of people, um, has had a gr as great an impact as anything that, you know, I give out books all the time and recommendations and it's been incredible the reception it's received. And, and I'm only surprised in the sense that I read it, I loved it. But I felt like, and I told you this before, that I felt that I lived it. So it really had a special place for me. I was, yeah, I mean, you'd I been was out on, there tracking lions. Yeah, I was yeah. with you. So I, I, I got all that. But it is, it is stopping people in their tracks, so to speak. These, these, and the, and these are people who are on all different parts of their journey. People that I think are super like woke and aware, they're just like, this is bringing it all together. And, and, and it's a number of things. It's the simplicity of the message. It's the great storytelling. It's fun to read. 
it's, as you said, it's, it's a short, it's digestible. And that, that gave me great insight into this book that I'm going to write all this stuff that I want to put out there. Well, maybe it's a series of books, but I want people to get it and read it immediately. And I wanted to read it in a day or, you know, on a plane (laughs) ride. Simplicity is such a, is such a difficult art form in some ways. I have, you look around, I've got, I have so many books back here, up here that I continue to buy. And I don't really read many of them. I'll read, I've read your book a couple of times. I'll read Aji Shante because the chapters are like, three and four pages yeah. so I can sit with it. Um, but it, it's, it's your book has, has really changed lives in just my inner circle. And so obviously I'm super grateful for you writing the book. I'm, I'm grateful that I get to share your medicine rather than just to, talking about my experience at retreat. I get to share it in, you know, sending out copies to friends and, um, And so there's a lot I want to unpack about this, but for one, let's talk about the intention behind the size and the digestibility of it. And, you know, when was this book born for you? Like how, what's the process like? I'm curious, again, as I'm getting to write my first book, like as a, as I'm stepping into this, like, what was your, like, what? Yeah. Um, I wrote a first book. The first book was a, because I, I wrote it at 23. Um, you wrote that at 23? Yeah. Cathedral I, of the Wild? I started it at 23, but it, but it took about four years. And, st- and it was four years of like trying to get it out. And when, you know, when you write a memoir when you're young, I mean, a lot of stuff had happened growing up out there, but yeah. one of the problems is you don't know what's important. And so yes. it was like, it was this epic and there was this backwards and forwards and this huge edit. And one of the things that I knew is the net, whatever book I write next, it's going to be simple. Like I want to try and write something simply. And mm. then for years, as is probably quite normal with writers, was I lived with the constant tension of I should write. I should write. I'm not writing right now. I'm not. And, you know, should, like, should, nearly, like, should. Yeah, nearly like five years went past, like I should write. I'm not writing. Uh, and people close to me would say, you know, you're living it. Like you'll write, you'll write the next thing once you've lived it a bit, like give yourself a bit of time to, um, I was like, I got to get something out. And there was all this panic around it. And then, um, but the lessons I was, I was learning things, you know, and there was, it was a time where I was, I would say this book is more masculine in some ways, you know, there's a certain masculine uh, structure to it in some ways. I was inside of a more masculine evolution at that time of like creating a more structured path. Um, and originally what the way that it came out is I went to do a talk somewhere. And so I had written a story about what it's like to go tracking. And when I sat down to write it the first time, I swear, like the first story I wrote, it was given to me in about three hours like this. And I felt like it came through the story about this day tracking. And then maybe three years went past. And then that same story um, but then like a whole, and at the same time that, that, that story, I was still going out every day with Alex and Ren and like more layers were being added to it. And it was like, it was like it was being given. And then eventually, um, eventually it took about six weeks once, once it sort of landed and that book came through and it really, it came through with a very simple set of, of lessons from trackers. And it was the way the trackers operate, the mentality, um, the mentality and the approach of the tracker became the very simple core. And so the the setup of the book is quite simply, it's morning uh, till afternoon uh, on the tracks of a lion, following a lion and all the things that happen when you do that and all of the ways that the trackers approach that process. You know, things like you can imagine... um, a huge wilderness with a single lion that has walked through it. And what you see the trackers do is they dial down the infinite possibilities of where that cat could have gone to a first track and then a next first track and then a next first track. And in that way, they continue to like refine the, all this possibility down into a moment. And you can see how immediately in your own life you could say, okay, how do I dial it down when I'm, when I'm looking for something? You might not know fully what it is, but it's, you can know 
the next thing that makes you feel a little more alive, the next thing that feels a little bit better, the next thing that feels like a step towards it, you know? And so the first track, I become really interested in unknowns and, and how much time track is spent in unknowns and how they, Renius and Alex, who I talk about in the bush, bush who are, you know, you've met them, two of the best trackers in the world, probably, you know, the minute they find a track and they don't know where it's going to go, they're, they're, to them, that's like aliveness. And mm -hmm. in this culture, everything is like security, right? We get sold like security, security, security. Like you got to know, you got to know. Oh. You know school, the whole school system. Fuck you got to yeah. know, you got to know. Answers, not questions. And to the tracker, it's like, I don't know. Yes, let's go. Let's find out. They go without knowing. They're present. Um, they teach themselves to see tracks. Like I've been out with these guys where, and I'm a, you know, I'm a high level tracker, um, but Renius will circle tracks sometimes. He'll, he'll take his little stick and he'll mark where the animal has stepped and I'll kneel down and look at it and I cannot see what he's seen. But this, it's a radical idea once I started coaching people that there is information there, but you have to teach yourself to see it. Like we could walk down a path and I could see a whole lot of what had happened down that path. And because you haven't spent a lot of time tracking, you'd walk down the path and see a little less. Renius would walk down the path and see like five times what I saw. And that to me was, as a coach, was a really deep idea. There is information, but you have to teach yourself to see it. Your path, the thing you're looking for, the tracks are there, but you have to tune in to how it speaks to you uniquely. Um, and so that's it's all in the book. And there's something, um, you know, even just the idea of, of following a lion, there's times in the book where, you know, when you track lions, it'll, it will turn the adrenaline on in certain places. Mm. Um, but to me, there's like a, there's almost, there's a balance between like trusting yourself. Uh, and when you go down, when you, when you're really following something that, that is interesting to you, that is a big challenge for you, that is calling to you, it should scare you just a little bit. You know, it shouldn't just be plain sailing. There'll be, you'll, you'll find some of your edges in that quest to like, can I, you know, do I have, can I, am I, do I have the courage to keep going for this thing that is really calling me? Cause it's going to, it's going to pull you into, it's going to pull you out of identity. It's going to pull you out of the safe zone. It's going to ask you to be open in new ways. And so I like the lion too, as a metaphor, because it should scare you a little bit going down this path. Mm, yeah. Um, it should, it should make you feel really alive. Yeah. It's, I love what you brought up. I'd never thought about it this way, but you know, use the example of Rainius, you, and then me and the different levels of awareness. And so as, as you're coaching people, you, you may see very clearly the path that this person, like you see like their, their resistance and, and where they're getting hung up but they're, you're only able to give them a little bit at a time. And so it's to be patient in that. Like they, they're they not going to see that. Like I'm not going to see the same uh, tracks that you see when we look at a, a game path. Yeah. And so, you know, the, you're going to start, you might see one, you might see every third one, but slowly you're starting to attune to that. And actually in the inner tracking, it's the same thing is uniquely that wild part of you knows what your path is, knows what you call to, but you're starting to put your attention on it. And in the beginning, you might only be able to feel like, okay, well, that makes my body feel really expansive and that makes my body feel really constricted. But as you keep attuning to it, it gets more subtle. What you start to tune into, what you start to sense, you start to feel at, at more and more subtle levels and the uniqueness of your own track, you start to learn it, you know? Literally, when you're tracking, you teach your eye to see a set of search images. Mm. Um, when you start paying attention to what actually makes you alive, you're teaching yourself to attune to that feeling of alive aliveness. And it's it takes time. It takes patience. But out of the awareness, you get better and better and better at it until you're living constantly on that flow, um, on, on that sense of, yes, there's my track. There it is right there, you know. Um, are you going to be in America? Yes. Do you want to come to Austin? Oh, yes. There's a lot of energy there. I know that that's part of the part, you know, and, and it's, you're living in what I call the following state, constant creative response uh, to life. 
and in tune with yourself, in tune with, with, with what life is asking of you. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's right. It, we've, we, we've, we're conditioned to spend so much time up in the, in the head to think, to be intellectual. And it's about taking that offline and getting into like what, the, like you said, the feeling, the feeling. and how to and move forward. There's the, the guy, there's a guy called Otto Schramm at MIT who talks about presencing as a, they talk about it from a management structure point of view, but they talk about leading from the emergent future. And I love that it's coming. And that to me is the tracker. It's almost like at high levels of tracking, you can feel what wants to happen. You can feel what you're meant to do. And you step towards that. And it, at, at first, it's the, it, it loses all rationale. It becomes this kind of knowing like, oh, that's, yes, that's mm -hmm. it for me. That's it for me. That's it for me. I know what I'm meant to do. I can feel where the energy is. I can feel how it's calling me. I can feel... Um, and it's just, it's just coming out of a kind of inner knowing once you know your own tracks. Well, I think that's interesting too. Uh, I think if something questions rational thought, then I, in my experience, you're on the right track because we've spent so much time there. And we talked a little bit about Joe Dispenza's work yeah. and his meditations. And it's a little, it sounds like it's a little bit about what you're talking about with this MIT guy. Yeah, and you and you start to see it with great trackers. You start to get a feeling for it's, hard, it's it, the language starts to fall apart a bit. But you, instead of knowing what you should do, you can feel what wants to happen, and because you're in harmony and presence, you're aligned with that. It's like it's a, it would be akin to something like you do a whole lot of training in the boxing uh, gym, and then when you get in the fight, it's like you're not actually trying to do anything. You can it's almost like your hand goes into the opening. You know, it's, it's like you can, all the training, all the attention that you've put there now starts to manifest as like a kind of instant knowing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's like the future is, time starts to break down and the future, the future is almost coming to you as in, in a different way. Uh, I mean, I'm in the realms here of like <laughs> what you see in great artists, what you see in great martial artists, what you see in great dancers where, you know, all the trying gives way to just a pure thing that's coming through. Surrender. A total surrender. And when you're deeply aligned with your authentic track, rather than you living your life, you're at one with what is with what life is asking of you. And it's not passive. Like you will do your part, but you do your part not out of any kind of shit, out of a knowing of this is... So, and from that place... Um, your whole relationship with time is different in some ways. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, oh, I know what I meant to do. And not only do I know what I meant to do, it's done. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to lose people on yeah. this one. Okay, bye everyone. Oh my no, God. No, no. I mean, this is like... But, but people know it because people have seen great mastery. Yes. You know, in those fields. Like how does Tom Brady create that kind of time on the ball? How does, how, how does things slow down for him? He, he, he's in the feeling of it. He's not thinking, okay, two steps back, right? He, he knows. And that is the same thing is possible out of enough attention onto your, the way your authentic nature speaks. You come, harmony, another way of saying it is, harmony is when everything is uniquely itself. And by being itself, it belongs. And so you become more and more yourself. You try less and less and more and more your life makes itself or life makes itself through you. Yeah. There's an acceptance of all that is exactly how it is. And it's, again, it's not a passive thing. It's not being apathetic, but, it, but it's, it's an awareness that everything is happening as it is. And, but I, I love what you said. You're like, the language kind of breaks down here. It a hundred percent breaks down. It's hard to really describe it. Yeah. And I've spent time trying to learn it. And it wasn't until, I mean, what it's middle of February right now It's probably the end of January, beginning of February where I got it. And I've tried to explain it to people and I sound like a fucking crazy man. I sound <laughs> delusional. And I think there's a bit of that in there, but no, but like I, I see exactly the path that I'm supposed to walk and how it, like you said, time is different. It's not like uh, I need to get to that point. And then once that thing manifests for everyone else to see, then I can be happy. That's like the old paradigm of once 
once I hit this goal, then this will happen. It's like, it's already happened. It's a matter of, you know, it will get there in time, surrender to the how and when. Yeah, because and again, this could be, it, you're not doing it. You're in harmony with, with its doing. Yes. You know, and by its doing, I mean like almost like the field of life, consciousness itself. You're in harmony with it. So it comes through you, but you didn't really do it. Um, it, well, it did it. And you were there for the ride. And that's, and I, you know, I love that you brought that up. I haven't thought about it that way because what I've seen and what I've shared with people is a vision like so much bigger than I could have ever imagined in a much shorter kind of time period. But there's the ego is completely taken out of play because that's, I guess that's what it is. I don't feel like I've done it. I don't feel like, I feel like I'm just allowing it all is supposed to happen. And I'm just a player in the thing, even though arguably like it's happening from me, but yes, that's it. It, It's all. These are, these are very paradoxical places. Oh, fuck. Thank you you for this. You got to show up for it, but you don't actually do it. Like I didn't write that book. I mean, I showed up at the computer and then it was given. Um, It's, I, I I both did write that book and not, and this, this is. Oh gosh, we're in the realms here. It's of, okay. Of, this is know. helping me uh, unpack this, what I'm going yeah, through right now. And, but you're out of your own harmony comes your unique life. And you're establishing your own harmony is removing the roles, removing the trauma, get in touch with what you know to do, stepping towards aliveness. And then, and then that's work. And then that work disappears, evaporates at a certain point and you live and, and it lives through you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> presence, you're at one with what wants to happen. It's, and it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's so paradoxical as well because there's so much, it's, it's like kind of so much chaos going on around. But, but for me, I've never been in such a state of ease with kind of so much on the line yeah. almost. And then gratitude becomes the barometer of, you know, just the gratefulness flows into that kind of state. And I guess what we're exploring here is the realms of mastery and, and and the way that these things flow through someone who's done their practice and been deeply disciplined inside of form and then given form up, you know, the discipline has has been the doorway then into like total freedom with what wants to come through. Mm. Yeah. And I love that idea because it's not like you just go out airy fairy and do a bunch of stuff. It's like you, there's still structures. Like when I was learning to do breath work and to meditate and to be out in the sun with my shirt off. Like I was doing those very mechanically, very uh, arguably mindlessly. And I've talked about this before on the podcast, but getting those reps in allowed me for when I really wanted to sink into that and explore it It as like, oh, I have like the boxer. I know how to punch. Now I know how to be in flow with it. It's not like I have to learn that again. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, in, in yoga, they say, you know, you get on the mat, you do, you, you do all the asana, all the positions, but the yoga is everything you can't see. You know, the, you do all the positions and then one day out of doing all the positions, you start to feel the state and you start to feel the union. Mm. Um, and, you're, and then it's not about the positions at all. It's about something else. But again, you can't really, t- you can talk about it, you can point to it, but then it, inside the experience is the only place where it really like takes root. Well, that helps me with yoga. I never thought about it that way. I mean, and that's probably the fucking ground zero for this whole <laughs> idea too. It's been around for so long, but I, I've, I've, I'll do it here and there a couple times a year. And it's always like, eh, I always feel decent doing it. I'm super immobile. And so it becomes a bit challenging in places, but it's not about that day is about building up enough reps until you can finally feel into that. To start to find through the practice, find your way into a state that then abides a state of stillness inside the practice that then abides in life. Mm. You know, that's as I understand it. Listen, you're looking at a guy who's has struggles touching his toes, so I'm <laughs> not going to wait, yeah. but that's why I'm uh, inside of tracking. I know what happens to me when I'm tracking, I'm trying to track. God, I'm looking for that track. I see it. I lose it. I see it. I lose it. Oh, I'm hacking a bit here. I predict a bit where the animal went. Oh, I get back onto it. An hour goes by, two hours go. Now here comes, now the eye is getting in. As the eye starts to get in, I start to feel the animal moving. As I feel the animal moving, I anticipate where it stepped. Now, I'm, now the trying is giving way. And I'm just, I'm in tune with that animal. I'm in a kind of resonance. I'm following and that's the key is that 
I'm tracking, but I'm, the all trying to track has gone. The tracking is happening. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the practice that I, I mean, and that's what that's to try and live like that. You know, to try and have the structures, the disciplines that allow that to all fall away into a life being lived through you. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, it brings to mind for me. We talked about this uh, earlier offline, but so much of I think my medicine is to share my direct experience. And, and if, if I'm speaking about something that I've just read about or heard about on a podcast or heard someone talk about, I, it, it, it just, I can't, I can't get behind it in a sense. But all that reading, all those podcasts, it all gives me context for when I'm in the experience. It's like, it, it allows me to articulate it. And so you need both. You need... I mean, you really need the experience more than anything, I think, but but you need to have the 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 reps. Yeah, and like what to me, like people have been trying to write about this for thousands of years, you know. Mm. People have tried to, and so having done all that reading, like it's like you have access to the language that points at it. And then when you have the experience yourself, whilst you could never really put it into words, there's a framework to even think about sharing it in, you know. And then your own unique voice comes into that. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. It's really interesting path trying to articulate the 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 unseen. Yeah, and it, it's um, you know I'm a big believer that there's there's nothing new out there. There's nothing I'm gonna come up with. No concept that I'm gonna come up with that hasn't been shared a million different ways. And so all these teachers, and I think that's where I kind of came to this almost like weird moment recently where it's like, oh, they're all saying exactly the same thing in their voice, in their own way. And now I actually have my own way to articulate it through through my experience, not just because I listened to a Ram Dass meditation or because I went to Ajishante's retreat because I went, spent time with you. It, it's 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 all the same messages that are articulated a different way. And then that hopefully there comes a point where it's just like, boom, it's all boom. Now it's within you. Yeah. Or it's always been within you. It's just now you know how to tap into yeah. it whenever you want yeah. to. And then I think it goes back a, to I that scarcity. Like, I don't have to, I got to write this down because I'll forget it. It's like, no, you won't forget it. You'll just call on it when you need to, and it may be articulated in a different way. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about, I had to ask you about the retreat. Now, again, I went on the Track Your Life retreat in July of 2019. Five day, four night retreat. I really wanted to ask you about the intentionality behind it. And I just want to point to a few things the first day we get there, we go out on the land and we come back and we have this dinner. We're all having dinner together. The six guys that are on retreat and then you, Alex, Rainius, the whole crew was there. And it was really just amazing, just, you know, camaraderie and sharing stories and, and really connected. And then, then the next day we do our thing. And that night, it was just the six of us for dinner. And what came out of that dinner was some of the most profound learning and connected and sharing that six guys who had known each other for a day, I'd never witnessed anything like that. And so that was powerful. There, was, there were some tears. There were people sharing stuff that I don't think they'd really shared before. And so like, is was that an absolutely intentional is that like how how does like give give me a little little yeah, info here you know i've i started running retreats uh what, six or seven years ago now and uh, i ran some really bad ones um just because mm -hmm. there the the art form of a retreat is to create a dimension this is what i've come to along the way and so we've learned that and part of what you want is like someone might be in a bad place on day two but you want to stay in the process in, that has been designed to that the process that has been designed to maximize the encounter with the retreat space. So the first day is just about arriving. Okay, you're in Africa, and you need to almost orientate to that landscape. Your your nervous system is orientating to the soundscape. That afternoon we go into silence. You get a, a sense of the lay of the land. 
the next morning the tracking begins um and so and you have that first morning under the stars mm. now you know we want your body to experience a natural circadian rhythm we want you to be out with the stars we want you to hear the birds um sing we want you to see the sunrise because it's coding into the body we want you to be on tracks and start to get into the mindset of the tracker start to follow a rhino start to follow an elephant bull um then we start adding in some points of some language so that you can start to talk about it and start creating circles to create safety. Then that night that you're describing, yes, leave everyone to integrate a little bit. What, what we learned on retreats, which we didn't do in the beginning because we wanted to give people value is, and we were inside of the cultural model that more is more. Oh yeah. Is that as part of it is giving people the space to actually integrate what's going on yes. and have the room to breathe. Our model is like more is more, but actually we have to get out of that into something much more natural, which is what in nature things pulse. We pulse into intensity and then we take the gas off. We hold the space and then we're not there to let the space constellate in a more relaxed way. What I love about that, especially for men, and this is uh, something that, you know, the retreat that we're going to have here in Austin in, in the middle of August, I mean, middle of April, uh, Matt and I have discussed this, that especially for men who are so used to like, okay, what's next? What's next? We do yeah. this, let's bang this out. Do, yeah. do. It's like, this is all about stretching time and giving them that space in and letting them sit in that discomfort. And then to see once they can start to get a little bit comfortable there to see what comes out of that. Totally. And a lot of the lost art form in the masculine is going downward. You spend so much time trying to build yourself as a man to be, you know, to go upward towards the light, to stand. But some of the art form is to give yourself the room to go inward and to go downward to the parts of yourself that are not great, to the parts of yourself that remain in shadow. And that can only happen with a little bit of space, you know? Uh, so it's all designed, for me, it's designed to maximize the encounter with the natural world, to get the best out of the tracking, and then to keep people in a process that pulls them into a different mindset. Um, and that's why we sleep out in the bush on that third night. Um, same thing, it's because it's another level into, now we have to sleep out here together. Now we have to keep watch. Now we have to operate well. We could get lions walking past. We could get an elephant bull coming into the camp here. And it just, again, it takes you, you're out on your, you're out on your feet, you're tracking, you're sleeping out. It keeps adding layers and depth and inside of that relational environment, it means you're experiencing yourself in different ways as you go. There's, there's time out in the camp, there's time in the circle, there's time to go down and inward, there's time for intensity. So again, uh, creating layers and layers and layers to the experience. Mm, it's um, beautiful. Well, and, and, I, and, and just to hone in a little bit on what that night out in the bush feels like on that third night, and I told you last night that was one of the main draws for me is, is hearing Patrick talk about it on the podcast. It's like, ooh, I have a lot of fear around that, around yeah. the unknown with the animals and how they're reacting. I think he talked about a hyena coming up. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, what the fuck would I do? <laughs> and, and so when you're in that space, you're very clear, like each of us stays watch for about an hour and a half. Um, so there's six of us that rotate and your job is to keep the fire going. Yeah. And it's not because, um, it's the only thing that's keeping us alive. And can you explain that a little bit? The, the, the fire is critical because the fire lets the animals know that we're there. It lights us and the scent of the fire, um, goes out. Now that can also mean that hyenas are inquisitive. They want to come and look. It's not a deterrent. But if a lion walks past, it knows you're there. Um, and so they may even come and investigate, but they don't get surprised because suddenly they're amongst you and people are waking up and there's lions next to them. There's a sort of a sense that this is like where we are. So we belong out there too. And that's our way of saying we're here too. Mm. You know, the fire is like a, a, a form of communication in that way. Yeah, and it was... You guys didn't mince words there. Like, Keep the fucking fire going. Well, because it's really, know, it's, it's not a case of there are no stakes. I mean, if no. someone falls asleep on watch, uh, a hyena will bite someone to find out what they are. A sleeping person, you know, 
if you get bitten by a hyena on the head, it'll bite your head off. Ooh, so yeah. you can get a hippo in the camp. Someone can walk out the circle of the si- firelight and get rolled by something. So it's once you're out there, you're in its rules. If you behave accordingly, um, 99.9% of the time, respect, awareness, presence are going to keep you safe out there. That's the language of that environment. But if someone gets it wrong, it can have dire consequences. Mm, yeah. And so just so people understand, like when, when you're on watch or when I was on watch, you keep the coffee on. So we always have coffee for the next guy who's waking up and every 10, is it 10 or 15 minutes? Yeah. Or if you hear something about 10 or 15 minutes, or if you hear something, you shine a torch. Yeah. So you walk, you kind of walk the perimeter and shine the torch and just make sure that everything's good. And again, that they know you're there. It's just another kind of indicator that, that we're present. Um, Isn't it an amazing feeling though, when you're sitting there by the fire and it's just you awake and there are these sounds around you and the sound of people snoring and sleeping around you. And you know, like their safety is dependent on me. But there's also this feeling of you might be the only person awake in the world. It's just so quiet and the owl's calling. And to me, that's, to me, being on watch is a kind of privilege. You know, it's just like to be alone under the stars and have that time for yourself, just you and the fire. There's something so ancient about it to me. Yeah, and it's, it is, it is such a gift. And I thought that you also did a great job of setting that up for us to understand that this is, this is almost like our gift to you. Like this is your moment to experience this. And it is, it's it, like, there's no, so I, I've told people about the retreat. Like if you have the disposable income, you, there's nothing you can do that will give you this experience of feeling alive in a way that you just can't comprehend until you're there. And I think that men in particular, um, we're meant to be out there. We were meant to be out there together. We were saying like, you know, if I run a group in the ballroom of the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa or, you know, somewhere at some conference center, like you have to work so hard to create safety in the group, to get people to op- open up, to get, you take six guys, track a pride of lions, done. It's in place, <laughs> yes. you know, because we understand, we coded to understand like, okay, this is real. We got to operate out here together. We got to handle this together. We got to stick together on this. And by doing it together, we were meant to. We were meant to move across the landscape. The body was meant to feel that. Um, so it's just, we were meant to watch the stars go down and the sun come up. That that wild man inside of us, he understands that. He understands that kind of the kind of integrity of that. And, and that becomes a doorway into the integrity of like, this is what I care about in my life. And this is what I'm going to live towards. That is the wild man. The wild man is not opting out and going wild. The wild man is living towards what feels true to you. Yeah, the wild man isn't the guy who's partying and drinking a bunch of beers. That's not, don't that's get that, that confused. That, that's no. the college guy. Because if you look at like a lion, wildness is regal. Something truly wild is regal and it is, has absolute integrity. And that integrity is established from inside. What I believe what I feel, who I am, that's how I come to the world. I'm not going to put it aside because, uh, you know, this guy is, uh, there's a big job, like job opportunity here. And so he's a bit of an asshole. So I'll just be like, but I'm going to laugh at his jokes because this is going to be, you don't do that. The wild man is at one all the time. You know, the wild man is not someone who's going to sign up for a job that's going to ruin the rivers um, or put it, put aside that piece because this is good business. You know, it's that kind of oneness. Yeah, that integrity. I like yeah. the way you put that. It's all, I think you touched upon it, but if I, if I can give just a little bit more uh, kind of color to what it's actually like to wake up before the, I mean, it's still nighttime and we come out and the six of us have a period of, is it 45 minutes or so where we have a meditation? Yeah, about an hour. And so you literally, you're sitting out and, you know, you and and Alex and Rainius have made the coffee. And so we have coffee and a little bit of some biscuits and stuff. And you're sitting in the silence of the reserve. And it's not silent. It's that the animals are, are kind of waking up or going to sleep. And what, what I found was, was 
really connected was as the sun is starting to come up and you don't see the sun right away. And I, I didn't really know this until I was there, but it's nighttime. You see all the stars and then it just starts to fade. And then it's like the sky starts to turn a little bit blue. And then it's just as there's this subtle shift, you start to hear the birds. And it's like, oh, the reserve is starting to wake up. And you can really feel yeah. into that. And the meta, I guess, what, what like, you know, when, when you run retreats, you're always like trying to work out what you want people to get out of it. You know, that's always your starting point. Like, where do I want people to end? And that's been a journey for me as I've done it more and more. But one of the things that I want people to get out of it is, I don't want them to leave the retreat. I want them to code a feeling in the retreat, a feeling of aliveness, a feeling of adventure, a feeling of joy, a feeling of community to the point where when they leave, and, and that shouldn't be like, oh, I went to the retreat and I and that's how I felt on the retreat and now back to life. It should be like that, the way you felt then, go work out how to live like that all the time. Mm. Go work out how to construct, build, follow a path that means you're in that all the time. You, you're in something that makes you alive, joyful, connected. So I'm trying to say like, it's, I think of it as inner cartography. I'm like mapping a feeling place and saying that feeling, like that's the place to live towards. Hmm. It shouldn't just be out on a cool adventure in Africa. It should be at every moment in your life, you should be designing towards that kind of aliveness. Hmm. Okay, I think one of the cameras went out. We're going to wrap up here in a second. I want to ask yes. you one more thing, but let me just change the battery. All right, we're back. We're going to wrap up here. Uh, Boyd's camera went out, and I just was, we were using the restroom here, and I just kind of chuckled to myself because there was an old version of me not too long ago that said, the fucking camera shouldn't have gone out. I was just got at least three hours on it. <laughs> but that would have been denying the fact that it actually did go out. And, I'll find with reality. Yeah. And so, um, you know, our pool out here, you haven't seen the other side of it, but the on the other side, it collapsed on the outside. Okay. And so there was a, there was a crack in the top and some water was seeping down and it's been over a year and i told the guys hey we got a crack up there and like leaves are getting stuck like just kind of fix it and so they they hadn't fixed it it was super cold last week it got below freezing and water had seeped down mm. ice collapsed yeah. the side of it and you know it's like a nice pool and all that and 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 our the woman who helps out here she's like you got to come see this and she was all hot and bothered and uh, so I go out to take a look, wondering like, oh, fuck, what am I about to see? And it was that the side of the pool collapsed. And the, the structure's still fine. It's just the slate on the outside. And, and I was just like, it was like my heartbeat just kind of went down a, a, a few beats. And it was like, oh, that, that's it. And it wasn't the old me that would have been like, those motherfuckers, I told them a year ago, this, that, and the other thing, that shouldn't have happened. And it's like, just it happened and it's gonna get fixed you know you're out of conditioned response yeah. you know, conditioned response conditioned response and there's more more awareness more presence then the conditioned response isn't so fast and in fact okay what's the right course of action and like you had said before it's like you just allow this space Yep. And with that space, you actually see things as they are, not as they should be. And you said a conditioned response. Yeah. More, more presence, less conditioned response. Mm. Conditioned response, there is exactly that. It's conditioned. Comes out of patterning. Uh, awareness comes out of awareness. Mm. Uh, less patterning, less role, less um, compulsion inside of it. And then awareness, and then right action. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it feels, um, I think just for people listening, it's be patient with all of this. It's it's so, like, when I started reading Eckhart Tolle, it was like two and a half years ago, oh, this makes so much sense. Oh, the pain body, this, that, the other thing. And I didn't really get it until recently. Yeah, I mean... Be, be patient is is a is a core message in a lot of ways, um, but I'm also thinking about like that piece of the old self. It it does it does feel like the old self, right? Because once you once you come out of the conditioned self, um, it it is that amazing feeling of 
of like a new person or a new a new self reacting you you are literally something different is reacting and you, you could call it a new self um but there's definitely a feeling of the old self being gone which is pretty wonderful okay let me wrap this up with you told me last night about 40 days and 40 nights yeah can you unpack that for people uh sure so uh for me i i like to have experiences uh, put myself into experiences so this year's big experience that I felt very called to for a long time, but haven't had the time to get to is to go and spend 40 days and 40 nights in solitude in nature. And what I ex- want to explore is uh, the mystic in nature, the archetype of the mystic in nature. Like why did all the mystics go to nature at a certain point? Um, I want to know what happens to your state of consciousness in the natural world for that period of time away from all of the movements of modern life. And I'm very interested in an ancient, the ancient art form of, you know, slipping your own state of consciousness into a new state of consciousness. And so in retreat spaces in Zen practice, for example, when people do a hundred days solitude of Zen sit, you know, the goal, the art form is, is to slip out of the known mind into the unknown in some ways. And so they say that you try and make what happens during your meditation and what's happening in the world one thing. And so you, at a certain point in the retreat, you don't know if you're in meditation or if you're awake in daily life. And it's exploration that I just feel called to I'm in the process of thinking about how to think about designing it now. But I'll be living up on a platform in a tree alone in nature for you know that archetypal 40 days and 40 nights. And I'm also, I've also realized a little while ago around work, you know, some would say who has 40 days to go, but like, I've come to realize that getting that still is my work. Getting that still is, is also giving me what I need to do my work in the world. And on some level it's really for me, but I know that out of that experience will come things that I have to share with people. And so weirdly it is the work, you know, um, of being myself. Yeah, and I love that. It reminds me of the the five day, the two five day silent retreats I've done, and how beneficial and transformational those have been for me. And and yeah, to your point, not everybody has five days to go spend in silence with a bunch of strangers, listening to some yeah. bald guy talk. And, and forty days, you know, like it starts on the sixth of July, and I've got it on the calendar. And even that in these times is kind of interesting, like. I, you know, I can't think of a lot of people who get to do that. And I, I do right now, so I want to do it. I want to go back to nature in that way. Yeah, and so, and I think what you actually pulled from that, and I wouldn't mind discussing just briefly here, is like, what's a practical application for someone who doesn't feel like they have the time for 40 days, five days, whatever? I mean, I would, the first step is do a five-minute meditation, but like to really get into that stillness because I think that is the beauty and you bring that into the retreat space as well. No phones, no computers, none of that, like really disconnect from technology. And I think that really helped, you know, with Ajishante's five-day silent retreat as well. But like, what would you give someone out there who's like, okay, how do I, how do I just get a little taste of this? I would say that there's an, there's an ancient Native American practice called sit spot. And what it is very simply is you, you go and sit somewhere um, in a particular place every day. And what happens is your relation, and you, and you sit and you, know, and you observe what happens in that area. So you might walk out to a specific tree, you might go to a park, you might sit on your veranda, you might sit in your apartment and watch the ledge. You know, it can be anywhere. But you sit there and you, for that 10 to 15 to 20 minute period, you build a relationship with that place. You notice every movement in that place. You notice the feeling in that place. You notice what birds come to that place. You notice um, what insects there are there. You notice what trees are there. You notice how that place changes over time. You know, And it's just a mindfulness practice, but it's very focused on a relationship with place and nature. And you can do it, you can do it anywhere and watch how your awareness grows by consistently going there and knowing that when you're there, you're there to pay attention. 
And how long, practically saying, would you say, like, at least sit for X amount of minutes? I would try and get over 15 minutes. Over 15. Yeah. Um, You know, five minutes is better than nothing, but go to a place every day and watch your awareness grow of that place. Um, it's a, that's a fun one to play with. I love it. I'm going to fucking put yeah, that into practice. Right. Yeah. Get by the that. way, if, if it doesn't feel right, I'll fucking stop it. So <laughs> again, these are all just ideas for you to try on a little fucking test drive. And if it works for you, great. Go if with not, your track. Yeah, your yeah. track. This is your track. As, as, as Katie would say, it's your school. This is, this is your, your life school. This is your track to follow, you know? And speaking of that, how can people find you? I mean, this will all be linked to in the show notes, but... Yeah, so just on uh, pretty much everything there. You can, you know, drop us a note there, let us know. Uh, come to South Africa. Uh, we're going to be doing more retreats in America um, in the next little while. Awesome. So, yeah, you'll be able to find it all there. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for coming on, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. All Been right. Beautiful.